Uh, I come from a parallel universe of media and uh, feminist women's rights organizing, which started way back in 1986. So I've been very lucky that um, I've been nurtured through the movement of the World YWCA in terms of my feminism, in terms of understanding how to apply the commitments to women's rights and gender equality um, in the different levels of governance. Um, and I have in my own, I guess, political journey been influenced by the experiences I have here in Fiji as a much younger woman, the first military coup in 87, coordinating the peace vigil following the 2000 crisis. And then really that trajectory connecting into progressing implementation of the Women, Peace and Security agenda because of the first Security Council resolution on Women, Peace and Security. So I feel very privileged that I'm part of a wave of Pacific Island feminists um, who have, who, um, who paved the way, but who have been contributing to the discourse on peace and security in the Pacific. And for me, the other part of that journey is making the linkages not only with political governance structures, but also faith institutions as well. Yeah. So I experienced my first coup in 1987 here in Fiji. And I think I was a very angry young woman in terms of the overthrow of a politically elected government. Probably at 21, you don't really understand the political implications and, and you know that kind of political conflict analysis. Mm -hmm. But we certainly were very aware that this clearly was not the way to solve any political issues. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was a military takeover as well clearly impacted on me as a young woman in the YWCA and I had certain experiences going to a World Council meeting that year where you were suddenly confronted by the fact that the military was taking you aside to check your bags and ask you about certain things and then the military was back there checking on you when you got back etc. So it really did affect my thinking around what does it mean to be politically active, aware, and organizing in those circumstances? Um, in 2000, when we faced another political crisis in Fiji, I guess I was a little bit more mature. I was also a mother by then. I think you know your, your, your way of organizing certainly changes because all of your different parts. Um, and so I found myself then as the Secretary of the National Council of Women, coordinating the Blue Ribbon Peace Vigil and creating a space where women were mediating in a very unofficial way uh, by, by meeting together in an ecumenical space at the Holy Trinity Cathedral. But as my dear late mother would say, coming together because prayer and action come together. The meeting in the church was so important because it was the Anglican Cathedral that gave us that safe space to meet in the, in the midst of such violence, the overthrow of an elected government, the fact that while we were meeting, Parliament was still occupied. And there were threats, etc., but we kept persisting through the 56-day hostage crisis. So it also became a space where, as the political prisoners were released, they came and we provided support for their families. We mediated from there as the members of the National Council of Women with other women's rights groups as well to come up with a women's action for democracy and peace. So it was not just within the National Council of Women, but reaching out to others in the movement, other women peace builders and human rights activists. And we took messages to the trade unions, to, to the media, um, and also to uh, the military council as well. I think for me that, however, was a clear example of just how outside we are 
even when women stand up in the midst of conflict, as we have seen in Bougainville and Solomons, that when the formal processes start, the women get forgotten. So um, that, that to me was really the start of another journey in terms of how do we hold these, yeah, these other intermediaries that come from, you know, the international, the multilateral intermediaries, the UN, the Commonwealth, who were coming in but not even talking to the women and having these high-level conversations. So the conversations were happening with the military, with those who had, over, who had overthrown the government, but not with the women. So that was the year also in 2000 that the United Nations Security Council adopted the first resolution on women, peace, and security. And one email from a wonderful mentor of mine um, was, you're doing this work on the media, here's the Security Council resolution, and this is how it starts. So the next phase was really connecting with other women peace builders um, from Bougainville, from Solomons, Vanuatu, and then subsequently Tonga after their riots in 2006. Um, and by which time we also had had another coup, um, to, to translate the resolution, to, to enable women at, who were peace building at the community level to know this resolution is about you, for you, and to create a lot of knowledge and awareness through government officials, including through the Pacific Islands Forum process. We subsequently had a network that was really just dedicated to promoting 1325 connecting it at the local level so women were talking about peace and development and human security. Even before the Bowie Declaration was adopted, we were engaging at the political level, collecting stories, documenting, and provided the evidence for the Pacific Regional Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security to be formally adopted by forum leaders in 2011. Um, that then, the work continues, you know, just because you have some some framework, it doesn't mean you stop, you just keep going. So how is it being implemented? Was it being resourced or not? It wasn't. So we had to work a lot harder to even continue to bring visibility to these political commitments and why they were so important, um, not just in the Pacific, but also then drawing attention at the UN level, because it's like you can have a suite of what, nine, ten resolutions on women, peace and security. But if it's not changing processes, if it's not changing the accountability, if it's not reforming the accountability, what's the point? So that's also why we have created the Pacific Women Mediators Network to say we've seen for way too long women being outside of the political process, that it's time to bring us back together to have the resources to meet, to create a pathway of young, for young women, younger women, to create a pathway of learning that um, provides that formal piece of paper to, for local women peace builders and to keep going in terms of our engagement both at the regional political level in line with the Blue Pacific strategy commitments, but also having young women coming in to be, for leaders to be accountable to younger women's vision for 2050. What does that mean, peace and security in 2050? I'll be 80 plus, but it's about my daughter, my grandson, you know, and, and their peers, yeah. There are, it's very easy to say a woman leader is a political leader, the woman that gets elected. But to me, a political woman leader is that local organizer who gets elected into her committee or into a district advisory council or sits in her provincial council. So I think we really need to unpack women's leadership and the, dip, the diversity of women in leadership roles. Um, and because quite often there is that sort of quantification that, oh, we've, we've got three women elected in parliament, you know, so they'll be the ones doing everything. No, it's that organizing, it's that mobilizing that's happening, that leadership. So 
for me, I'm very interested in my work as to how we bring visibility to that level of leadership um, that is happening organically and that is happening in a way that really reaffirms why we talk about these gender equality commitments, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The fact that back in 2012, there was the adoption of the Pacific Leaders Gender Equality Declaration. That's the head of state saying we are behind gender equality. But it's not a women's issue. It's a political declaration. So how are you going to hold your country accountable? That's one. Two, gender equality means the balancing. You know, it means that analogy of a bird needs two wings to fly, right? And the fact that in the Pacific we have such low levels of um, political, formal political representation, we have such high rates of gender-based violence, we have such high rates of women's unpaid care work, um, and the fact that economically we're not in a place of social protection for women outside of the formal structure, we say, you know. So it's absolutely necessary that Pacific Forum leaders, including in their different tracks, whether it's the Melanesian Spearhead Group or the other sub-regional groupings, that they are creating a way in which it's not just about women will come and talk about women's issues, but what we expect is that you are getting briefings from across the movement. Our network can come and brief you on political issues, on peace building. There's another network of women working on human rights and legislation. There's another group of diverse women working on disability rights. So we also want that recognition that it's not about handpicking one, two, three that in every single pillar of the Blue Pacific strategy, there must be young people who have a specific focus on one of those pillars. There are persons with disabilities, there are LGBTQI groups, and the women's networks as well, and the faith groups. So that's what we mean in terms of how they should, it's not about whether they should be brief, it's how they should be brief, yeah. So one of the things we have issued in our solidarity statement as the Pacific Women Mediators Network is we need to know from the mothers how they'd like to be supported. We need to know from the women's networks. And so I think it starts with finding a track of work in which women can feel safe and protected to actually talk about not just the end of the current phase of violence, but what next? Um, and within that, supporting them to be part of their formal political processes, as well as having their own solidarity support. So if I go back to the peace vigil, how in the midst of the crisis, we had that type of support that we could sit down and talk together from the different networks to say, okay, this is our strategy. And when I reflect on the Women's Action for Democracy and Peace, you know, what came out of a couple of meetings, there was economic security, there was the political work, there was a reference to young women, you know. We knew where we needed to take it, but what was happening was the patriarchy blocking it and saying, you know, well, women, you do nice peace vigils, but you don't really need to be in this political process. So. I would always insist that the women need to be supported